Um, Professor Graham Edgar has been a tutor with the Open University for many years and is a current D2100 tutor, vice chair of OOPS and a regular contributor to OOPS Weekends. He is a professor of psychology and applied neuroscience at the University of Gloucestershire where he works in the general area of cognitive psychology with particular interest in the areas of perception and situation awareness. Graham and his colleagues have developed novel methods of measuring situation awareness and they are the first group to link situation awareness with the underpinning neuroscience. Current research includes studies of driver behaviour and working with fire services across Europe to develop tools for assessing and training firefighter situation awareness. Graham has spent a substantial amount of time applying psychology in the real world. He has written for undergraduates at all levels and was an author of the Perception and Attention chapter in D300 and the Perception chapter in DSE 212, and he's contributed to D100. We are delighted to welcome Graham this evening for this lecture. Where did it all go wrong? A career in human factors. Thanks, Graham. Okay, thanks, Abby. And uh, here we go. Um, I'll just draw your attention to the uh, trigger warning down the uh, down the bottom here. Uh, we have some adult material in this lecture. I'll try and uh, warn you when it's coming up. So uh, if you want to uh, look the other way, uh, that's absolutely <laughs> absolutely fine. Um, okay, this is a talk about human factors, and I'll try and give you some idea of what it is, um, what it's about, why psychology can lead you to human factors and what you need to do if that's what you want to become. So, oops, oh, hang on, let's just try this one. Ah, okay, um, this is what we're talking about really. Um, there is a distinction in the area between human factors and ergonomics. Um, ergonomics tends to be sort of the more physical side, so is your chair the right height, that sort of thing. Uh, human factors tends to be uh, more the cognitive stuff, the, the actual psychology. So this is what we're dealing with, the uh, the human brain, in essence. And to you know, give you some idea of what we are dealing with, let's have a look. Um, it's got about 10 to the 11 neurons in your brain, and that is about 100 billion neurons. Uh, as Fred pointed out last time I did this talk, I had my billions and trillions mixed up, but I think I've got it right this time, so uh, we'll have some errors somewhere else instead. I don't think we're picking up a taxi. Okay, so about 100 billion neurons, each one um, synapse with about 7,000 other neurons, so phenomenally complex structure, and widely regarded as the most complex object in the known universe. It certainly is an impressive uh, piece of kit. So given all of that, uh, why does the human brain decide that it wants to do something like this? This is the sort of issue that you're dealing with um, as a human factors uh, professional, the strange things that people decide they will do. And your job is to try and design systems that will either stop them doing it or allow them to do it if they want to. Um, but <laughs> you're trying to um, just make life better, really. Um, when you come across good human factors, it tends to be quite obvious, um, although you tend not to notice it so much, because anything with good human factors, it's well designed, it works well, and you just use it, you just don't tend to notice. So there's a couple of examples of nice, I'll just give this yellow arrow, of uh, good human factors. This is uh, a map of Warsaw, uh, Old Town in Poland, of course, and it's just a lovely thing. It's a lovely sort of little sculpture in its own right, but it also gives you a map of the old town, but it's 3D and it works equally well for sighted or non-sighted people. Just something that works really well and really simply. And it's got Braille on the top there as well with uh, directions and stuff. So just a really nice bit of, uh, bit of human factors. A similar one, this is uh, in uh, Florence, this is the She-Wolf sculpture uh, with all the uh, blurb in front of it. And if you look at the, uh, the blurb from a different angle, it's got a, a braille overlay. So sighted people can read it and so can non-sighted people. I did wonder how the whole sculpture thing would work for somebody that couldn't see it, but that's another issue really. Unfortunately, there are probably more examples of bad human factors than there are uh, good, and I'll show you a few of those. First one, uh, this is uh, an obvious one. Uh, most people have come across this, that impossible, really hard packaging that the only way you can get into is with 
scissors. So packing scissors that way, well, you get the idea. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is the information desk in uh, Chopin Airport in uh, Warsaw. That's one of the people. That's the other people. Um, they seem to have made a slight error in the uh, <laughs> in the height of their uh, information desk or their chairs. So you can certainly tell when things are not going so well. Okay. Okay, Batman. Um, Usually a sort of uh, really good example of good human factors. You know, Batman is famous for all the uh, gizmos and things, but not always. Um, got some clips here from the uh, upcoming Batman movie. I did have a video, but unfortunately it doesn't work on Adobe Connect, so I'm afraid I have to make do with a few uh, a few stills. But here they are. This is uh, Batman in trouble, um, being attacked by a ferocious shark, which has managed to get itself wedged into the ladder by the looks of it. Uh, and uh, Robin, of course, is in the back copter, just uh, just overhead. Batman, in desperation, calls out for uh, Robin, hand me down the shark repellent bat spray, obviously. And this is where you see the human factors really starts to go awry, because here is the uh, the array of bat sprays. Now, from a human factors point of view, you can see the problem. There's no redundant coding. They're not color coded. They're not shaped. You, know, you can have them shaped like the fish you're supposed to be repelling, whatever. Uh, but they're all very similar. It's only the writing that's different, and that is an accident waiting to happen. In an emergency, when Batman's in trouble and you're reaching for the bat spray, you could easily get the wrong one. You'll be reassured to know, however, that Robin does reach for the right bat spray, and so I think all was well. Another example of bad human factors. I saw this in my local supermarket, and uh, I was quite thrilled. I thought, Fantastic. I'll uh, get a couple of uh, bottles of that and knock them back really quickly, and that should really help. And of course, when you look at it more closely, you realize that this is, in fact, uh, of course, sink on blocker. Um, well, I suppose it would shift the fat, but uh, maybe not quite the way that you intended. So again, bad human factors. The most prominent thing is the, uh, the big sign, not what it actually does. So bad human factors. Another example, which you see quite a lot, particularly in quite complicated systems, is this. Uh, too many features. And you see how this happens. Uh, you start off with a simple bit of kit, and then somebody says, well, why don't we have a so-and-so on it? Why don't we have Wi-Fi? Why don't we have whatever? And before you know it, uh, it's a bloated and completely unusable system. You can actually uh, buy um, a pen knife like this, I believe. Um, I, I think it would be a fantastic thing to own. Completely useless, but yes, impressive. So does this happen in real life? Well, let's, before we get to real life, Look at Iron Man. Um, interesting system here. This is, uh, those you know, Iron Man, of course, he can fly around in his suit and he has all this uh, high tech stuff. And what I'm interested in here is uh, this sort of stuff. He's got uh, what we would call a helmet mounted display. I used to work on these back in my, uh, my day with British Aerospace. And very good and very simple idea. You basically uh, project information onto a visor in front of the person, and they can see the information on the visor, and they can see the outside world at the same time. So you can keep looking where you're going and still get all the information. Inherently good idea. The trouble is, and the temptation with all these things is, is to put up too much information. Because, because you can do it, the temptation is to do it. And I would say that Iron Man has rather overdone it here. Um, he's got way too much information up there because one of the things we know from psychology is you can only process so much information. So if you've got loads and loads of info, um, yeah, it's all there, but you can't make any sense of it. You say, well, does it ever happen in real life? Well, yes, it does. Um, this is the uh, helmet mounted display for the latest fast jet, uh, known as a Tempest now, I think. And I actually did some work on this when I was uh, at Aerospace. I was working on the stereopsis side, trying to present images to the two eyes, which is not a trivial problem. But one of the bits of advice I gave them for free uh, while I was doing that was say, well, whatever you do, don't put too much information up on the uh, helmet mounted display, because people won't be able to take it all in. What they need is the right information at the right time, not everything at once. Obviously, they didn't listen. Uh, you know, I left before this ever came into service. Uh, but they actually lost the contract, I think, for the uh, helmet, according to this article anyway, uh, because they're saying there's so much information <laughs> on being projected onto the visor that the pilots can't see where they're going, which you have to say is a bad thing when you're traveling at 1,000 miles per hour. So uh, I was very tempted to uh, get in touch with them, so I told you so. But that would just be churlish, maybe. 
Okay. So, um, fundamentally, it's the human and human factors that makes it so challenging. Um, it's the case of almost any system you can put together. Humans will find some way of doing something stupid with it. Um, and that is what you're trying to deal with as a human factors person. You're trying to understand the psychology. You're trying to understand what people will do and trying to understand the rather weird uh, mistakes they're likely to make. And you know, some people uh, have an inherent faith in the human factor. So, uh, for example, here, um, another example, I've got a collection of these photos, I've been collecting them for years, but, you know, faith in the human factor, this one I must admit, uh, using the heebie-jeebies. And while some people do have great faith in the human factor, uh, human factor specialists don't. Um, one of the things you soon come to realize when you uh, work in this sort of area is how remarkably, uh, well, there were very strange things that people can do. And what you find is, is that people can be plain stupid. They can do remarkably stupid things. You've got somebody here with the acetylene torch uh, blasting the, uh, <laughs> the bottles of fuel. This is not a good idea. Another one here, having a fag with the uh, flammable gas. And this one, well, I don't know what to say about it, really. It's, uh, it's one of these uh, <laughs> what happens next type, uh, type slides. You can't have a feeling this is not going to go well. But one of the problems you have when you're designing systems and trying to get them so that they will work is that people can not only be stupid, but they can combine that stupidity with great ingenuity. Um, you know, the phenomenal human brain can do, <laughs> can do remarkably ingenious things and do bad things in a, in a clever way. The next one, I think, has to be my favorite uh, slide for doing something rather stupid, but with tremendous ingenuity. I just uh, rather like this one. Okay, so what, what's the job of the human factors person? It is to allow for human capabilities, so the systems, bits of kit, whatever, will work with what people can do, the basic cognitive capabilities that people have, but also to deal with that inherent uh, <laughs> stupidity and ingenuity that you are trying to uh, trying to work with. You're trying to stop people, well, you're trying to make things easier to use. That's one of the things you're trying to do. And you're trying to stop people uh, hurting themselves or others. So what I'll do is uh, talk through, uh, sadly, a rather tragic case. This is quite a sad case, I'm afraid. But it does show the sort of issues that you're trying to deal with um, in human factors. Uh, so we'll have a look at this. This is uh, an event that happened at uh, Phelps Hospital in New York. And the person it concerns is Michael Colombini. Um, he had a headache. He was collapsed. He was taken to the hospital. And they gave him scans, uh, so MRI scans and so on, and found a lesion uh, in the brain, uh, basically a brain tumour, which they operated on and successfully operated on it. They gave uh, Michael a follow-up uh, MRI scan to see how it had gone. And uh, one of the things about MRI scanners is that they generate tremendous magnetic fields. Take your watch into a scanner, that's the end of it. This is uh, Mark Greenlee, um, who I did a project with, just out of interest, um, Psychologists are very concerned with ethics. Um, I did a project here where I was in the scanner for about two hours. This isn't me, but uh, I'm quite claustrophobic. So being shoved into the scanner, I found incredibly uncomfortable. Uh, they gave me this panic button saying, don't worry, if you feel uncomfortable, and I was in there for about two hours, uh, just press the button and we'll come get you out. What they didn't tell me was they forgot to connect it. Uh, so talking of ethics, but hey, we got through all right. Anyway, big magnetic fields. That's an example. Show you uh, some examples of these big magnetic fields. Just going that way. These are things that have been sucked into a scanner because of the yeah the basic whopping great magnets. So a wheelchair, wash bucket, office chair, uh, trolley, uh, drip pole, gun. The gun was interesting. Apparently, a police officer went into the MRI room and it drew it out of his holster, hit the side of the scanner, and it actually went off. Um, luckily, nobody was hurt. Floor polisher. Uh, bed and a horse. Okay, I'm only kidding about the horse. I just love the idea the horse was wandering past and having to catch the horseshoes. I think they're actually scanning it, of course. Okay, so uh, going back to the case, uh, Michael was sedated for the scan. Uh, it was after the operation, and he was he needed oxygen. Uh, 
And that was being provided by two cylinders that were strapped to the wall of a computer room that was driving the, uh, the scanner. Uh, the cylinder should have been changed, but it hadn't been, and it ran low, and the oxygen actually ran out. So the anesthesiologist uh, rapped on the window and called out for more, more oxygen. He couldn't leave the room, I think it was a he, um, because uh, oh, couldn't leave the room, and he was you know, managing the anaesthetic, and there was no microphone to or phone or anything to get anything else. So the tanks would need to be swapped over, and the staff were struggling to do it. Uh, a passing nurse heard the call for oxygen, picked up a 20 pound oxygen canister from the other side of the hallway from outside the MRI room and brought it into the MRI room. Uh, the nurse passed the event horizon, which is basically where the pull of the scanner was greater than the weight of the cylinder. The cylinder shot into the scanner and hit Michael in the skull. Uh, after initiating brain death protocol, Michael was pronounced dead two days later. Okay, so this is the sort of thing that um, in some ways you feel you can contribute to. Yeah, I was not involved in this incident, I hasten to add. I'm just looking in from the outside. Um, but one of the things that an investigation will often do is look at how did it happen. And that's very easy to work out. So in this case, how did it happen? Uh, the nurse picked up the cylinder, carried it in the MRI room, and that precipitated the accident. That's what happened. And we call that the active error because you can see the link between the action of the person and the actual incident. So there's a really clear link. That's the active error, the final error that uh, precipitates the accident. But in some ways, the how question is the easy one. What you really want to know is why did it happen? That's where you can actually look and see, OK, why did this happen? And more importantly, what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen again? Um, so in that case, you're starting to look much more carefully and further back in the process. What you're often looking for is not the active error, which is often quite obvious, uh, but the latent errors that set up the conditions that would allow that to happen. They are often hidden away. They can be the culture of the company. They can be mistakes that have been made you know, years ago. But they sit there, and then they allow the incident to progress and to actually happen. So let's have a look at some of the earlier errors. The canister wasn't swapped earlier. If it had have been, there would have been no problem. Uh, there were steel canisters within reach of the MRI room. If they'd been, you know, none within you know, any sort of distance, they couldn't have been carried in there. No microphone in the MRI room. If there had have been, the uh, anesthesiologist could have called out or could have called for help over the microphone. There would have been no confusion, and the incident wouldn't have happened. Open access to the MRI room. A lock on the door would have stopped this accident. And finally, the nurse carries the steel canister into the MRI room. So these. First few, really, if you like, are the latent errors, and the last one is the active error that actually precipitates the uh, the problem. Just out of interest, there was a one horrendous uh, latent error, which wasn't really involved in this case, but it's this last one. Uh, there were also steel fire extinguishers in the MRI room, so they actually had uh, steel fire extinguishers uh, strapped to the wall of the MRI room. So in the event of a fire, if the fire hadn't got the person in the scanner, the fire extinguisher probably would. So that's a really, uh, really you know, horrendous uh, error tucked away in the background there. So who was to blame? Um, in this case, this is unusual. The, the hospital took full responsibility, just said, OK, we will take responsibility. We'll work out what went wrong. We'll look at the why questions. And we will get better procedures. And this is exactly what they did. So rather than just saying it's the nurse's fault for carrying the, uh, the oxygen in there, um, they actually looked at the whole chain. And it made for much better processes. So I've got some of the sort of human factors type theory in the background, really. And this is a really nice model. It's my favorite because it involves cheese um, for looking at um, how these incidents occur. And this is uh, James Reasons. Uh, it's called the Swiss cheese model. You can see why. And the idea is you have all these uh, slices of uh, cheese. And each one, if you like, is a possible uh, block to an, an accident happening, you know, like locking the door of the uh, MRI room, whatever. But each of the holes in your Swiss cheese is a way in which a mistake can happen and the error can be propagated through to become an accident. If the holes all line up, like here, then the sort of error propagates through the system and you get the um, accident at the end of it. If you can block off any of these slices, block any of these holes, then you can stop the accident. <clears throat> and it's a really nice little model, really, of how it all works. 
And just as an illustration, don't try and read this slide. It's just uh, to sort of screw your eyes up and say, what the heck thing. Uh, but this is uh, looking at what's called the error chain. It's another another version of the Swiss cheese bottle. The idea that any accident doesn't usually happen from one incident. It's a, a series of errors that uh, propagate through, like through the ch Swiss cheese, and you get the accident. So these are the error, error chains, or the slices in the Swiss cheese, whatever you, you like to call them, uh, that led up to the Michael Colombini uh, accident. And if you look at the sort of boxes, a lot of them are what you could call if-only boxes. If only this had been changed, if only this had been done, if only this had happened, you wouldn't have got that particular error. And uh, yeah, if you have any experience, and you hope not really, but if you ever had an accident, like a bump in a car or whatever, you, afterwards you tend to think, oh, if only... If only I hadn't done that, if only we hadn't gone there, if only this hadn't happened. And that is the error chain leading up to the accident. Most accidents are a series of uh, a series of sort of unfortunate incidents, really, that lead, lead to the final uh, accident. And one of the jobs of a human factors person is to try and break that error chain, try and put in checks and balances, try and stop that error chain uh, happening. Okay. So, human factors, um, two jobs really, summed up in one rather nice phrase. This is from uh, Eric Holnagel. Um, human error is best understood as a judgment made in hindsight. Isn't that true? Um, it's, much, it's always easy to see where things went wrong afterwards. And so, two jobs. One is to analyze incidents uh, without hindsight, and more like the ones I've been talking about, to look back and say, well, knowing what we know about human capabilities, is it reasonable to expect somebody in those circumstances to have been able to avoid the accident? And that's one of the jobs of a human factors um, person. And often you, you, know, you can get involved in um, accident investigation and so on, looking at what's happened after an incident. The other one is to provide the hindsight in advance. And this is to be actually involved in the design process and say, okay, let's look at things that are being designed, like the Boeing, like anything else. And if you like to or C, problems, knowing what you know about humans, try and work out where the problems might be and counter them before. So, you know, take, you fill in the holes in the Swiss cheese, take out the latent errors, break the error chain. That's what you're trying to do. I'll give you an example of this, which I think is it's almost legendary in uh, human factors. Now, this is the, uh, the sexual content. So if you're uncomfortable with that, look away now, and I'll tell you when to look back. But uh, it's summed up by this particular paper. I'll give you a second to read that. OK, these particular injuries um, resulted from one particular uh, piece of kit, particularly. Not just, there's quite a few papers like this out there. Uh, but I'm going to put up a picture of the piece of kit and also an excerpt from the paper. And I'll give you a couple of, <laughs> a couple of minutes to read this. Here we go. I would put money on the fact that whoever designed this piece of kit did not anticipate that this was the way it was going to be used. So you could say that's a human factors failing, but and in some ways, you know, <laughs> as a human factors person, you are looking to try and um, look for these odd bits of uh, behavior. Uh, just out of interest, this is, of course, also the same company that was uh, involved in the free, free flights debacle, uh, so not very good on the human factors. But... Uh, that is what human factors is, trying to um, <laughs> trying to foresee the errors before they actually occur. Okay, if you were looking away, feel free to uh, to look back and uh, look back now. Okay, um, so if any of that you think, well, this is good fun, I would like to. Uh, um, and to become a human factors person, then, uh, oh, I see someone's raised their hand, but if you want to hold questions and stuff till the end, then please do. We can, there'll be time to, uh, to come back and, uh, and chat about those at the end. So if you want to go into human factors, here are some of the um, sort of key organizations, if you like. Um, for the UK, it's the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. Um, that's a professional body. In America, it's the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. And everywhere else, it's the Applied Ergonomics Society. Um, so, 
Um, I'm not a member of any of them, actually, because they, you have to pay for it. And I'm a member of enough societies as it is. But they're a good start, particularly the CIEHF, if you want to get any details about uh, human factors and so on in the UK. If you fancy doing qualifications, uh, these are places that do them. Uh, I'm afraid the, the website's a bit of a horrible long one, but if you go to the CIEHF uh, website, you can find all the details there. Most human factors courses tend to be postgrad grad MSCs. Um, this is because you tend to need a really good broad um, knowledge of psychology in human factors. That tends to be the, 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 yeah, the basis of it. So the best thing to do is to do the psychology degree, get your BPS accreditation, all that sort of stuff, and then do the human factors training afterwards. So uh, get all those through the CIEHF website. Companies that employ human factors people, um, well, all the big players. Um, so Kinetic, that used to be part of the MOD, but it's now a big private consultancy. DSTL, which is the um, still part of the MOD, it's their research arm, if you like. And the big uh, players like BA Systems, Thales, Boeing, um, and I presume places like Dyson, especially given the last example that I showed you. Also, small consultancies uh, will often uh, have human factors people. But yeah, there's, there's all sorts of jobs out there, really, for human factors type people. And uh, if you want to look at the sort of issues in human factors, I've just put up this uh, website for a really nice blog. Uh, my friend uh, Martin Langham has um, been doing human factors for many years. He did the human factors for the Princess Diana crash in the, uh, in the uh, tunnel in Paris. Um, but very nice blog on the issues and what it is to do human factors and all that sort of stuff. So that's well worth a look. Okay, um, I've talked sort of about general things and you know just uh, stuff sort of in the you know, big incidents in the news. I thought I'd spend the last little bit just having a look at my career. And uh, here we go. Uh, for some reason, uh, toilets seem to feature um, more than I would have expected in my career. But let's have a talk about uh, about those for a minute. Here's me uh, in a ladies' lavatory in North Wales. Um, there was no need to call the police because this was actually in a police station. Um, the reason I'm in there is because I was trying to do some measurements for some uh, emergency lighting, and I needed to get a certain distance. And the only way I could do it was just get that little extra meter or two was to open the door and take the <laughs> reading from in there. But another job I had in my uh, BAE days was this one. This is the Nimrod um, maritime surveillance aircraft. Um, it was an interesting project. This was the new maritime surveillance aircraft. And for political reasons, which I won't go into now, they won the contract with a bid to refit a 30-year-old airframe, which was interesting. But anyway, um, I was brought in to do what's called the uh, lighting philosophy. And this just means doing all the lighting throughout the aircraft. So I did everything. I did the uh, the cockpit here. I did the mission area, which is where all the radar and things go. I did the galley, which is where they go for their cup of tea and stuff. I did the ordnance area, which is where they do uh, dropping things on submarines and dropping sonar boys for detecting things. And I even did the bomb bay. <coughs> I did all of that. It was a significant piece of work. and be cross-referenced with standards, all sorts of things. So this was uh, quite a big piece of work. I was rather dismayed that having done all that, um, just before it was due to go into service, the prototype, well, yeah, the place the first ones were flying, the system was done, it was it was ready to go. Uh, for, again, I think for political reasons, it was cancelled and scrapped. I don't think it was a lighting philosophy, although maybe the chandeliers were a step too far, but uh, unfortunately, it was uh, was scrapped. So all that work, well, that's life really. But just out of interest, this is. Uh, one of the uh, problems I had, as I did the lighting for all of the um, all of the areas, you know, um, mission area, uh, ordnance area, cockpit, everything. Uh, only one bit did I have trouble with. Only one bit that the RAF weren't happy with, and that was the toilet. Why was it the toilet? Well, one of the things the Nimrod does, yes, it looks for submarines and stuff, but it also does a lot of, uh, or did a lot of air sea rescue um, work. And to do that, um, it has a lookout area where something just stand basically and look out and try and see survivors in the water, that sort of thing. And it often, is often doing this at night. And of course, the thing about uh, looking out at night is you want to be used to the dark. You want to dark adapt, uh, which we know from psychology that people dark adapt. And we know how long it takes. It takes about 20 minutes for the eye to fully dark adapt. And then you're, you're most sensitive and most likely to see things in the water. <clears throat> so that's 20 minutes. 
The problem is with the uh, the way the Nimrod was laid out was that the toilet was in the lookout area. So somebody spent 20 minutes dark adapting, somebody goes to the loo, puts the light on, that's it. The dark adaptation's gone for another 20 minutes. So I had to try and come up with some solution to try and stop this happening, human factors. Uh, so I came up with what I thought was a really neat idea. Uh, it'd be like a fridge in reverse. So you open the, the door of the toilet, the light goes off, you go in and close the door, the light comes on. And I thought that was a great idea, but the RAF would not accept it. Um, I won't say why they won't accept it. They had a good reason, which I only found out talking to them in the pub. But uh, anyway, they wouldn't accept it. So in the end, I had to uh, go for sort of low-level lighting, which was uh, you know, a bit of a compromise. But in terms of human factors, if only I'd known about one system, it could have solved all of those problems. I regard this as one of the best examples of human factors I've ever seen. And here it is. This is the LavNav. Um, fantastic human factors. So um, let's have a look at how it works. Very nice system. Basically, um, you stick it on the uh, underside of the toilet seat, like here. And it uh, has a motion sensor in it. So most of the time, it's not on. But if you somebody wanders in there in the middle of the night, it picks up the motion, and it switches the light on. So you don't have to dazzle yourself with a bathroom light, which is nice. You've got this low-level light. But what's brilliant about it is it also detects whether the loo seat is up or down. If the loose seat's down, it shines green light, and if the loose seat is up, it shines a red light. And this, I think, is the really key, brilliant human factors bit. If it shines a red light when the seat is up, it also shines a target into the uh, toilet bowl for um, oh, to aim at, basically. You think, well, now, isn't that great human factors? Come back to the, the, the lab now. Oh, you can still get them, by the way. They became the loo light for a bit, but now they've got this rather weird name. Uh, but you can still get them on Amazon, and they only cost about a fiver. I'm not on commission or anything, but uh, what a fantastic piece of kit. I do have one. I don't use it, but I do, I do have one. <laughs> okay, no talk about toilets is possibly complete without talk about the ship old fly. This is, again, almost legendary. This is the problem that uh, people who use urinals have a tendency to miss and it makes a horrible mess. Uh, and well, this wasn't actually the first place they were used, but it's the one that's best known. Um, well, and great name as well. Um, oversaw the introduction of an idea that was devised by the cleaning manager, which was to etch um, a little fly just near the uh, plug hole, basically, on the, uh, the urinal. And what happens is it gives people something to aim for. And people don't like flies, so they're happy to aim for it. And found they got about an 80% reduction in spillage and about an 8% reduction in uh, bathroom cleaning costs, which is impressive for just one little fly. Um, and this is effectively a nudge. Richard uh, Tyler, uh, winner of the 2017 Nobel Prize for a nudge theory, he referred to it as his favorite illustration of a nudge. And a nudge is really good human factors. What it is, you're nudging people to do what they want to do anyway. So you're yeah, you're just encouraging the behavior that they would naturally do, and that's a nudge. So this is a nudge, um, and it's just a really nice example. Problem is, uh, it doesn't seem to keep working, uh, because I, I think, again, this is classic standard psychology. I think people habituate. Um, yeah, you have a go at the fly a few times, and you get bored, and then you don't sort of uh, don't do it again. So I thought I'd just finish this lecture by um, a bit of sort of uh, human factors in action to think about how we could deal with that problem. You've got the problem that people like something to aim, <laughs> aim at when they're going to the loo, uh, but they get bored. And so if they, so they you know, stop using it. So the fly works for a while, but then maybe it doesn't work for much longer. So here's my idea. And remember, you heard it here first. This is to modify the, uh, the lab nav. So the lab nav just shines a simple target onto the, uh, the toilet seat, onto the toilet bowl, or urine, or whatever, gives something to aim for. Well, my thinking is maybe, rather than just a target that stays the same, you could have something you don't like, like the fly, to aim for. And this can be anything. I've got the, uh, the virus in there, just because uh, I don't like it at the moment. Um, but also, I thought, well, what you could do is connect uh, this up to a mobile phone app, and then you could just have whatever um, you like in the toilet bowl. So anything you don't like, you could put in there. And you could change it each time you go. And I don't know about you, but with my list, I would never need to use the same picture twice. Um, and you'd always have something new to, uh, to amuse yourself. And that, I think, um, solves the problem. That's human factors. And when every toilet in the world has got one of these, just remember that you uh, heard it here first.
Okay, so I think that's enough um, about toilets. Um, but one of the things you know, I'm trying to get across here with the whole toilet thing is that any system where you have an interaction between a human and a system, there will be some human factors um, going on there. Everything from my know, secateurs to space rockets, there will be human factors if a human is interacting with um, with some sort of system. And that's why that uh, oops, human factors really is a job for life. But more than that, it is a job for life. You are trying at times trying to either save lives or look to uh, prevent accidents happening in the future. And that is the end of the talk. Thank you very much for your time.